while since we've looked at this topic with uh, some of the breaks in between. <laughs> Let's just step back a bit and see where, we're, where our equation is for uh, membranes, and particularly for reverse osmosis, what these terms mean, and, and then we're going to end off this section with some examples. So we've, we've looked at uh, several membranes up to now, and in the final membrane we're considering is the reverse osmosis membrane. And the standard equation for all, all the modeling is that our flux leaving the membrane is a product of two, two terms, permeance and driving force. So another way you can see that is for the driving force divided by resistance. So that's probably the more standard way we've seen it up to now in this course and in your prior courses uh, to 4M is that you've looked at driving force divided by resistance, but inverse of resistance is called permeance in the membrane world. So it's a term there that's commonly used. And permeance is very easy to calculate. We'll, we'll have some examples on that. Where it's a product of simply the driving force. And then, uh, sorry, if you're given the driving force, which is easy to measure, it's the differential pressure, the differential osmotic pressure. And you're given the flux, again, easy to measure. You can back calculate what the permeance is. So we'll, we'll look at an example. The tricky part of permeance, though, is the units. Because depending on how you measure J, whether J is a volumetric flux or a mass flux, and how you measure your driving force, your permeance is just going to take those units and absorb it so that it's really self consistent. So, very careful when you're working with permeance and looking up data in the literature, looking up data in reference books that you also consider what the units are of the flux and of the driving force. Driving force is easy to deal with. It's usually atmospheres of pressure. Right? So delta P um, is often given in atmospheres in this area. But J, it can be varied. J can be either a mass flux or a volumetric flux. And depending on which one you pick, the units of permeance will change. So um, maybe for permeance, on the assignment, can only be two things. If the driving force is constant and the number of mass and flux, yeah, if I go to the SIA, it should be only like two. There's two ways of expressing permeance that, yeah, it's a, well, either be in mass when J is in mass or in volume measure flux. So that's right. Now, that's in our course, but you're not going to, this is not the last time you're going to see reverse osmosis. So when you look at literature, especially in US literature, that uh, driving force and permeance will be given in different units. Okay, so, Let's take a look then at some of the, the principles here and let's maybe step back and to look at a picture to order to understand some of this drawing, uh, this equation. So we had shown this last time, let's just quickly recap that if we take my membrane over here, so here's my membrane, and let me consider the concentrations in this membrane. So if I plot on an on a diagram this way, so this is my concentration. With my zero point. And my concentration here is referring to concentration of solutes in the solute. So C is kilograms of solute per meter cube solvent. And what's common in membranes uh, uh, when we're dealing with reverse osmosis is we'll, we'll even just simply call that kilograms of salt per meters cube of solvent because most often these are are used for desalination. So simplify that often to kilograms of salt per meters cube of solvent. But let's leave it general and then let's consider this side to be the feed side and this is the permeate side. So if I'm feeding material into my membrane, we've, we've discussed last time that here's some sort of bulk concentration, and there'll be that will be relatively constant, and we'll just peak slightly here and get you the wall concentration on the feed side. On the permeate side, we said our usual assumption up to prior to RO was that our permeate had no, no concentration of solute in the solvent. So we always assumed our permeate to have zero solute or zero salt in the solvent. But that's not true for reverse osmosis. Reverse osmosis, that membrane, uh, does a great job of, of removing the salt 
out of the solvent, but it's non-zero. Okay, so over, over here we will have some definite concentration, we call that seawall on the permeate side, and it will come down and get us some concentration here, C permeate. Or we'll simply just call that CP. Okay, and then through that membrane there'll be some drastic temperature uh, concentration gradient. So those are our, our terms in this expressions that we're going to see here today. And those are what are de defining our driving forces in terms of osmosis. Remember this difference in concentration sets up an osmotic pressure difference. And there's also a driving force here because of the concentration differences. So let's take a look then at, at, our, at our system. We're going to model firstly the solvent. So that's our first equation up here, JV, the solvent flux, is given by this term P sol over Ln. Now P sol is the permeability of the membrane. But if we take permeability divided by thickness, so permeability divided by thickness, we call that permeance, we'll give that a new name, A sol. So A sol, we'll often use A, capital A is for, for permeance. So A sol is the permeance of the sol. <coughs> That's, that's, the, that's the term that has the units that will be different depending on what units J sol are in and what terms your pressure. So that's my permeance. And then delta P minus delta pi, that difference is equal to my net driving force. Now I can also take a look at the flux of the salt through the membrane. So not only is my solvent moving through here, so I have some sort of solvent passing through here, JV, but I also have salt passing through that membrane. <coughs> so there's also J salt. Very, very small, but because this is non-zero over here, I do have salt bleeding out in the permit. So I can calculate what that flux is. I'm interested in that. Um, and obviously, I'd like to reduce this where possible. So we would like to make this term J salt small in practice. So J salt then is the product of its of the permeance of salt through the membrane. So A salt is different to A salt, A solvent up here. So A salt is the permeance. salt through the membrane. So permeance of the solvent up here through the membrane. And the driving force there is the difference in concentrations on the feed side minus the permeate side. And so here is where this approximation comes in. The true driving force is actually this wall concentration minus that wall concentration over here. That's the driving force through the membrane, is that concentration difference. But in fact, we approximate these two to be equal on the left-hand side, and we approximate these two to be equal on the right-hand side. And to the even though there's a very moderate gradient here, and a moderate gradient here, we, we disregard it for the purposes of modeling. We're recognizing that we cannot measure in any practical way what that wall concentration is on the feed side nor on the front side. But it's very easy to make that uh, assumption more realistic by simply changing our configuration here in the membrane model. We've spoken about this last time. We operate at very high velocities through here. Or we add um, devices in the, in the flow path to create turbulence. Then it's very straightforward <coughs> and, and realistic to make that approximation at the bulk. Concentration is equal to the wall concentration. 
So this bulk is easy to measure. The permeate concentration is easy to measure. The wall concentrations are impossible to measure. That's a recap then of essentially where we were last time. So let's uh, let's take a look then at, a, at an example that I wanted to, to look at last time as we, we ran out of time there a bit. So let's take a look at it now and spend today's class on this example and the one after it to, to wrap up this topic. So we're treating water here. Um, so this would be water from a well, interior to a country, brackish water from near uh, from some source, one and a half, 1.8 percent by weight sodium chloride. So ocean water, we had said in last prior time, ocean water has uh, about three and a half percent salts, and that gets you an osmotic pressure of 25.2. Okay, so 3.5 percent would imply a 25.2 atmosphere osmotic pressure. So if we're treating water that's 1.8% sodium chloride, we expect a number less than 25. So there's, there's a piece of information we'd like to calculate. So we're treating this water 1.8% sodium chloride, 25 degrees Celsius, and our feed side here is 1,000 PSIA, or 68.5 atmospheres on the feed side. On the permeate side, we have easy to measure 0.05 weight percent sodium chloride at the same temperature, but this pressure over here is 3.42 atmospheres. Here we're given permeance of the water. Um, the next example is going to show you how we calculated that. We're given permeance of the salt. The next example will also show you how we can typically calculate those two values. So for now, we're given those two. Given that, calculate the flux of the water in L and H and by two, calculate the flux of the salt through the membrane. Take two, three minutes, no calculators, simply plan your strategy. So as we discussed in class last Friday, we were reviewing the midterm, it's the strategy that's more important than anything else here. What is your strategy for calculating these two fluxes? What do you know, what you don't know? Draw a picture, or well, you don't need to, it's already up here for you and figure out your approach for this and discuss it with the person next to you.
JV equation. So let's take a look. JV equation up here. You're referring to the first one. Yeah. Okay, so if we use the JV equation, we're going to need A solve delta P minus delta pi. Okay, so this term over here is the delta pi. Delta P is actually an unknown, which we didn't add up with. So delta P is another unknown. Okay, A sol given to us JV is going to calculate our liquid flux. So let's start by looking at delta P then. So if this is our plan is to use this equation delta P. So just the you know that it's 68.5 3.42. Okay, delta pi. Set is pi f minus permeator. What are those? Okay, it's equivalent to CRT, so C feed minus C permeate times RT. <coughs> Okay. What units are C in? Yes. Okay, so if we use the R in the notes, we need 
This was 8.2057 times 10 to the minus 5 and was units of Seventy meters cubed. Seventy meters cubed. Okay, so we need temperature in Kelvin. Atmospheres will will stay there because that's our final result. So we need meters cubed per mole per moles per meter cubed for concentration. So concentration CF it needs to be in moles per meter cubed. So I'll let you calculate that at home. 628 volt per meter cubed. And then CP is equal to 17.1 moles per meters cubed. You can sub in over there and calculate delta pi is equal to, if you will, I've written it out in a longer way, but the pi of the feed is equal to 15.4 atmospheres minus the pi osmotic pressure of the permeate 0 0.042 atmospheres is then the difference. So sub in this calculate the CEF multiplied by RT and you can calculate the osmotic pressure difference as the difference between 15.4 and 0.42. Okay. So you need to figure out how to calculate this and that. Okay. Basic quick calculation. So we've got that delta P and we've got our delta pi. We've got a solve given to us. We can go ahead and calculate JV if we follow the series plan. So JV, sub in over there with a solve and delta P. Let's just take a look at this. And this is where I said, let's be aware of the units. So JV is A solvent times delta P minus delta pi. So delta P and 
pi are given to us in atmospheres. This constant over here, 1.1 10 to the minus 4, is given as kilograms per second per meter squared atmosphere. So let's just do a quick uh, check on the units. Kilograms per second per meter squared atmosphere multiplied by atmosphere. We're going to get the mass flux. So JV is actually going to be uh, the mass flux for us. We want to calculate the flux of water in LMH. Is that a, mole, a mass flux, mole flux, volume flux, volume flux? So JV is going to be a mass flux. We need to get a volume flux. What's the relationship between the two fluxes? Firstly, let's actually correct our notation. Is this really JV? Okay, that's J. So notice up here in the slides that JV, J solve, we have to take care of the units, as, as I mentioned before. So though we shouldn't always just describe JV. This is J. It's a mass flux. So to convert between mass flux and volumetric flux density. So the relationship you can write out then for yourself is rho times JV is equal to J. So mass flux is the product of the density times the, the volumetric flux. So we can sum in over there and calculate JV is equal to A sol times delta P minus delta I divided by rho. So put in, put in those values, the 1.1 to the minus 4. For a solvent here, we've got delta P, delta pi. We know rho here for the fluid is, is water. So JV then, you'll get an answer that's in meters cubed per meter second, per, meters cubed per meter squared seconds. I'm just going to convert straight to LMH, because if you're in meters cubed per meter squared second, you get numbers that are very small. So multiplied by 3,600 seconds per hour, multiplied by 1,000 meters cubed, uh, 1,000 liters per meters cubed, and you get 19.8 LMH is your answer. If you, if you don't do that, um, I don't have the, the answer here in, in small numbers, but it's a number that's incredibly small. So multiply by 3,600 seconds per hour, we want L and H, the L is there, and we want L liters, so we also have to multiply by a thousand liters per meter cubed, and we'll get this number. Is that reasonable? 19 point eight. So if you've got one, one meter squared of membrane, and you operate that guy for an hour, you'll only get 19.8 liters from it. All right, so you're putting in all that energy, 68 atmospheres, and you've got this one meter cube membrane, you only get 20 liters of water. Does that sound right? Sounds like reverse osmosis is hot. So let's take a look here. Perry tells us a typical RO plant where we're producing water that costs us about 7 cents per liter or as low as 1.5 cents per liter. They have elevations of up to about 25. Okay? So this is an, an inlet concentration of 6.9 NPA. So this is pretty reasonable, 19.8 um, LMH. Okay. Reverse osmosis is hot. You need a lot of area and operate it to be operated continuously to get any sort of reasonable amount of water, which is now should explain to you why this, this plant looks like it does. But these are spiral wound membranes, so there's a very, very high surface area in every one of these. But you need to be operating a lot of them to get any reasonable amount of drinking water to, to surface a city or a small town. Okay, so that's, that's exactly what RO is about. It's expensive. Flux of the salt through the membrane. Same plan as before here. Different plan.
Sound reasonable, everyone? Use this equation, yeah? Up there at the back, Ken? Yes, reasonable, wake up. <laughs> okay, so J salt is A salt times CW minus CP. Do we have all the information we need to calculate that salt flux? Really? Okay, so we, we, we can make that assumption that C wall is C bulk. So I've got my bulk concentration, I've my permeate concentration, A salt. Check my units. Check your units, I should say. Okay, so A salt has units of So our concentrations then, when we're doing this, we need to change our concentrations from molar concentrations to our regular <coughs> kilograms of salt per meters cubed solvent concentration. So mass of salt per meters cubed of solvent. So let's take a, uh, that, take a look at that. So CW minus CP. If we take a look just at CW, What's that concentration as a mass concentration? Right, so we want we want this to be in units of kilograms per meter cubed. <coughs> this is two D, two F. Okay, so times it by the molar weight of salt, so grams per mole. So back up here, that's 628. You can go multiply by the molar mass of salt. Another way you can do it is what Mark had suggested earlier: is assume a basis and calculate that. Right, so assume a one meters cube basis, and you can calculate that. So if we if we have know that it's 1.8 weight percent, we can say well that's equal to 1.8 grams of salt divided by 98.2 grams of water if you consider 100 grams of mixture. So in that ratio, 100 grams of, of this mixture, there will be 1.8 grams of salt, 98.2 grams of water. So that's still, that doesn't get us kilograms per meters cubed, but I can then go multiply that by one kilogram of salt equal to a thousand grams of salt. So that will get rid of my salt units over here. There's a thousand. I can go multiply by a thousand grams of water. <coughs> is equal to one liter. And then I can lastly multiply by a thousand liters. So that gets me, my feed concentration comes in at 18.3 kilograms per meter cubed. So CW or CF. It's similarly for the permeates. So the permeates, we're told is at 0.05% by weight, so that uh, is equal to 0.5 kilograms per meter cubed. Same calculation. Yeah? No? Makes sense? Okay, so 
once we have these two concentrations, CW and CP, we're then pretty much ready to go to calculate our salt flux. We've got all the terms we need multiplied by A salt. A salt has got units of meters per second as given up here. So if we multiply kilograms per meters cubed by meters per second units, we're going to get kilograms of salt per meter squared per second. So you can help sub in over there, J salt, and show that that is equal to 2.85 times 10 to the minus 6 kilograms of salt per meter squared per second. Simplify that out to 10.2 grams of salt per meter squared per hour. So the reason why I've gone to grams of salt per meter squared hour is to get numbers that we can actually interpret. These tens to the minus six are really hard to work with. But over here in that unit, um, on a per hour basis, we can now easily compare the two fluxes. So LMH, our water was coming in at 19.8 LMH. Our salt flux here is, is, is actually quite low. Within one hour, we'll only allow 10.2 grams of salt to pass through that membrane for every hour on a per one minute squared. So we want, we want sort of ballpark numbers here to get an idea of what's moving through typical membranes. And if you operate this for a whole hour, during that hour, only 10.2 grams of salt moves through from the feed side over to the permeate side. So that's a pretty low, low flux over there. Any questions on Like a lot of you are just kind of fast asleep and it's actually really frustrating, right? You're obviously just not thinking or doing mind just elsewhere. This is actually a straightforward problem. You should be doing this in like five minutes. So I'm actually pretty surprised that you're kind of all just looking at me blank like this is new stuff. I'm not sure why. Yeah, Jim. There's no rule. Every okay. book will work in mass fluxes, some references will work in volumetric fluxes, others will work in British units, others in SI. So it just matters on what permeance is measured, and then if you can convert it to a volumetric flux, that's what you Guaranteed you'll need to convert pretty much every time you, you work with an R of volume. Um, yeah, from the flux, there are temperatures that are the amount of salt that goes through, and uh, right. like, is that like the main reason why like, they don't use reverse osmosis to do to get salts because it's not what it is. So the purpose of reverse osmosis is to get pure water, yeah. or as pure water as possible. It's not, not to create salt, right? We're not interested in that. We just pump that back into the ocean. So what, this, uh, what these numbers indicate for you is that passing through this membrane, here we've calculated these two fluxes now. Right? We've calculated that over here, J salt is a very small amount of salt, 10.2 grams every hour. So if I operate a one meter squared membrane, I'm only going to get 10.2 grams per hour passing through there. A JV was 19.8 liters per hour. So so it just gets you an idea of the orders of magnitude. That's Calculate and interpret quickly what is JV times CP. If I take the volume of liquid passing through that membrane multiplied by the salt concentration, what does that number give you? What is the interpretation of that? Don't you, I mean, you can calculate it numerically, that's not 
too much. Uh, that's not hard. But take the units of JV, multiply by the units of CP, and see what you get. Molar flux of So we'd be dealing with, what would those be? So JV times CP. JV's units, meters cubed of water, solvent, per meter squared per unit time. Okay, multiply by CP's units. Kilograms of salt per meters cubed yeah. of water. Okay, so the purpose of doing this is whenever we're dealing with solvents and sorry fluxes and concentrations, I encourage you not to just write out kilograms or meters cubed. Write out kilograms of what? Is it kilograms of the salt? Kilograms of the solvent? Meters cubed of the solvent, and so forth. That will You'll then never get any of these things wrong. You'll never make a mistake with the calculations. You'll never also forget to convert between mass flux and volumetric flux. Okay? So extend your unit's calculations to be a little bit more specific than just writing meters cubed. So now we can see here we get a product of kilograms of salt per meter squared second. And the interpretation of that is J salt, okay? which is the salt flux through the membrane. Okay, so it's a different way of calculating the salt flux through the membrane. Yeah. So you don't actually need to know what the means for salt is if you have a better information. You just calculate your J salt. Okay, this is where the, it's, we've come to some distinction. Yeah. Also, wouldn't CG be changing? So the water, the solvent is carrying the salt yeah. through at a certain concentration CP that you get out here. So the product will then get you the salt flux on that side. This is like, and so a steady state that will be a constant. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the reason why I wanted to go through that discussion is because we're going to see and. Coming up in the next slides, that we will, let, we will relax the assumption that, and, and actually consider what the retentate concentration is. Up to now, we haven't considered anything about the retentates. Notice that we've not spoken about it at all. We've assumed our feed comes in and travels through, but we haven't really focused on that retentate concentration. Yeah. You ask us here how we get the Yes, so that's the next example. Okay, so we're going to do this one at home where you're given all the other information and that help with the permanence is. Okay, it's an easy one to do. Okay. Done in the lab. So same as uh, same as we saw in filtration, you do a lab experiment with, uh, with some given material, calculate the fluxes, you, you record your pressures, and then you can go calculate the permanence. So let's take a look at that just from a um, discussion point of view. In a lab, you do an experiment to calculate JSOL. Very, very easy to measure. Meters cubed coming through your membrane per unit time, per unit area. We know the area of our membrane, so we can calculate JSOL. We know our delta P, we can easily measure that. Delta pi can easily be estimated, so A-SOL then can be calculated. 
from a, from a small lab experience. Does it change the thickness of the membrane? Good question. So A salt, does it change with the thickness of the membrane? So let's take a look at A salt. A salt is the product or the, the, the division of P salt through LM, the thickness of the membrane. Okay. So it's a, A salt is a given property for a given membrane. So A, you, the moment you change your membrane, even a membrane with the same thickness, but made in a different way from a different com, uh, composite, will change A salt. So A salt has to be determined experimentally. We cannot predict what it's going to be. Have to continue to do Same for uh, J salts. J salt, once we calculate our, our salt flux, J salts, then we can say JV times CP, get, get our, our salt flux, and then calculate uh, A salts. Okay, so you'll need this JV times CP product to get your salt flux. In the next question, you need to calculate J salt from the product of JV times CP. Over here, we know CW, we know CP, and then you can go calculate A salt. So A salt and A salt are very easy to calculate from uh, lab experiments. So that's the, that's the strategy you'll follow here for this next slide, 67, where we're given a lab experiment, we're given the area, we're given our feed, solution, so our feed concentration, we're given our permeate concentration, and we can then go calculate uh, our permeate concentration, our permeate flow, so 1.92, and then we can go calculate the A salt and A salt. So I'll, I'll write out those values and leave that for you to calculate um, on your own time. It's very straightforward as we just discussed. Our approach over there, so A salt, a solvent for you to go and prove is 2.07 times 10 to the minus 4 units of kilograms of solvent per second per meters. Ah, oh, sorry, per, per atmosphere per meters. Same, same units as before. In the previous example, we had a permeance of what is 1.1 to the minus 4 kilograms per second per meter squared atmosphere. The permeance in this example is 2.07 to the minus 4. So similar number, same units. And then a salt. coefficient, this is the last new terminology we'll introduce here. Rejection coefficient is given by this equation. We've seen it before actually in, in ultrafiltration. Rejection coefficient is 1 minus Cp divided by C0. Except in ultrafiltration, this is instantly 0 because in ultra, uh, the Cp is 0, so the rejection coefficient is 1. You reject everything in ultrafiltration. But it, because we're having some salt travel through the membrane, our rejection coefficient is not 100%. And this ratio, Cp over C0, and we subtract it from one tells you the percentage of rejection. So very straightforward part. One final thing just to note about the rejection coefficient is, obviously, we can go and express that in just a slightly different way over there. Notice here we can say R is 1 minus Cp of a C0. We can also write that as 1 minus pi p of a pi naught. Okay? If you've calculated pi using C times R times T, because the R T will cancel out. So very often you can just do, do a quick short kind of rejection. So we'll wrap this section up uh, next week after the break.